Ready? <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you for coming out for this standing room only event. It's pretty exciting. Um, I am a hydrologist with the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. There's several of those types of people in the room tonight, so I'm a little nervous. But uh, I have uh, some info to present from the Priest River Experimental Forest. I did the graphics myself. And I have 119 slides of tables, graphs, charts to convey this info with, so we better get going here. Just kidding, I don't have that many. <laughs> um, OK. I am going to be presenting excerpts from this publication. Um, it's a general technical report. It is a peer-reviewed research report from government uh, uh, government printing office prints them for us, but these are available online. And I have a sign-in sheet in the back next to the snacks where if anybody wants a PDF version of this emailed to them, please give me your email address and I can send these to you later. Um, there's also about 10 hard copies that you guys are welcome to as long as they last. So. Um, one thing you'll notice for the astute is uh, my name is not on here. Uh, it's one of the secrets of my success. I take credit for other people's work. <laughs> so uh, this document was printed and uh, published in March of 2015. I consider this a recent publication because 2015 I think was two years ago. Or was it three? But anyway, it goes quick. But this was 2015, and I have a few updates um, to the data that was published in here. Um, the Priest River Experimental Forest is, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it is located in the Priest River watershed and has some unique stuff and neat stuff to present, along with all the info we've been hearing about fisheries and water quality and water quantity in the Priest River watershed. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to talk to you guys about this. OK. Um, and we have some Priest River Experimental Forest people here that I'll introduce at some point. So this was um, a look at uh, over 100 years of climate data that's been con collected daily at the Priest River Experimental Forest. Um, snowpack data as well, and some stream flow. It was previously summarized in another general technical report in 1983. Um, so this one is, the 2015 is revisited. So if anybody wants this 1983 publication, maybe put a note by your email because I can also email you this for those that are really into this stuff. But uh, so this is another general technical report from 1983. It's the previous look at the climate up to that point. So um, my name's also not on this one. Where were you in 1983? I was here, but I wasn't. Uh, About that tall? Yeah. So the experimental forest, it is. Uh, part of the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. And it's located, for those that don't know it, where the star is, we're down here in town. And you know the Priest River watershed looks something like this. So it's located eh, almost central in the, the Priest River watershed. Um, the experimental forests were established nationwide to encompass different ecotypes, ecological zones, different forest types, things like that. And the purpose was to conduct research and learn about different forests, forest management, all kinds of different stuff. The list of forest research that's been conducted at these is, is quite broad. And, um, but we are lucky to have one of these in our watershed. Um, Weather has been collected for over 112 years at the same spot. This particular experimental forest was established in 1911, and one of the first things they set up was a weather station, and they started daily measurements. So 
with that persistence, we have 112 years of weather data collected at the same spot. Am I in your way? You're fine. I'm cheating and looking at your laptop. Okay. Um, so some of that is temperature, um, daily maximums, daily minimums, and then averages of those. Precipitation is measured. Humidity for periods in there, wind for periods in that total uh, data set. There's a gauging dam on Benton Creek, which is on the experimental forest, and the dam was installed in 1939, and there's a stream flow record for nearly the entire period of record um, on stream flow that comes off that small watershed. And then there's several snow courses. There's two on the, the place, a low elevation snow course and a high elevation snow course that we do cooperatively with Natural Resources Conservation Service. Peter will present uh, tonight too about the stuff they've got going, but we try to help out with that greater, greater effort. Um, and then all kinds of other data here and there. A um, couple of historic photos. This is the weather station in probably the 20s. Um, this is like a shaded instrument shelter where the thermometers are located. This is low tech and tonight's presentation is low tech, um, which I think has value because we're gonna look at how the climate has changed over the last 100 years basically at the same spot. And I'm curious to see how that compares to those in the room here that have some more experience and see how it, if this matches what people feel has happened. Um, and all of the stuff here is manual. So the thermometers are indexed. So temperature moves the fluid with an index in it to a high and then just physically gets stuck there. And the low temperature thermometer has the same thing. So, I mean, it, this is low tech, um, which I think is reliable. There are some more modern instruments recording and everything, but a lot of this has been low tech and consistent for 112 years. Precipitation is basically measured in a calibrated bucket and is measured daily. So we've got some low tech stuff, which I think has value in its uh, simplicity. Uh, here's just another photo. This is how many government employees it took to operate the weather station at that time. We're, increased efficiencies, we're down to one employee now. So <laughs> we think that's pretty good. Um, Hannah in the front row here is the current superintendent at the Experimental Forest, so she's great. And um, maybe embarrassing her a bit. Nicole is also an employee there right now too. And if you guys wanted to catch her, either of them later for questions about the Experimental Forest or whatnot, she's, she's a good sport. But instead of all these people, we've now got one multitasking person there, so. Uh, another historic photo of the weather station from different perspectives. Uh, this one's kind of fun. You'll see a lot of consistent equipment in the weather station, um, but this one has a, a tall larch. I think it's like 150 foot tall larch. And we'll, we'll zoom in up here at the top. <laughs> Hannah still climbs that tree every day to get the wind speed up there. Unfortunately, the tree is no longer there and that was deemed maybe unsafe at some point, but at different times, researchers were wanting to know wind speeds at different heights through the tree canopy. And so some, it's probably a guy, would climb that at intervals to measure an anemometer on the top. So uh, we've, we've made the weather collection a little more safe over the years too. But I like that picture for that. And here's a more recent view of the weather station. Uh, the building in the back is the Priest River Experimental Forest headquarters. Uh, thermometer instrument shelter, rain gauges. There's a more modern recording weather station there that's their concurrent. And uh, one bit of math I did, if I did my math right, tonight will be 
the 40,851st visit to that weather station from a government employee that would walk to it at 5 p.m. each night. And that's pretty neat to me. Um, I'm proud of the work that the folks at the Experimental Forest have done before I've gotten there and while I'm here because to get data sets that are like this over a century of consistent measurements that are stringent in their accuracy and methodologies takes a fair amount of due diligence and I was like, ah, I wonder how many times people have walked from the office at 5 p.m. and done the work and 40, over 40,000 visits, so. Yeah, the weather gets measured at 5 p.m. each evening, uh, precip collected, everything like that, so yeah. Yeah, yep. One of them is centrifugal force to reset it, so it's on a, on a bearing, so you spin it, and, it th and then the other, you tip it up. So each day, a human has to go touch it and, and do it. And so I think that's kind of neat. I also have a pretty limited social life, so what I think is neat is, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. Uh, and here's a, a view from Crow's Nest looking down onto the experimental forest compound with the weather station being central in the photo, office next door. There's some, this is old enough photo, some of the buildings aren't there anymore and whatnot, but. Um, okay, getting to some of the temperature and trends. This uh, is a chart, we don't need to look at it all. Um, on the right hand side are the extremes of the period of record. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But the data, was using averages. So I mean, pretty simple math. I mean, for, for daily maximum, it's the sum of 365 maximum temperatures divided by 365 days a year to get to some of these daily and monthly values. So it's, it's not high-tech computer simulations of what our climate's gonna be doing. This is just a look back at what has happened. So a lot of the analyses are working with the averages. Um, for those that really want to get more into the calculations, methodologies used, reading the entire um, GTR gets a lot more to what I'll talk about tonight. And, um, and by the way, if anybody has questions, I think we have plenty of time, so keep questions coming if you have them. Um, but uh, basically, this is the daily maximum temperatures, daily minimums for each month of the period of record. That's for the whole period. That's mm -hmm. the whole 1911 to 2013, so 102 at the time of publication. Yep. I thought I forgot it was 2015. Mm -hmm. I forget that too. But basically, your average temperature over the course of the entire year has been 56 degrees. Doesn't feel like that in July and doesn't feel like that in December, but that's the average annual temperature there. Um, one thing that's notable that you guys all know who've lived here, our average temperatures in the winter months are 31.6 for December, around 30 in January and 37 in February, basically around special temperature where water is either ice or liquid. So that comes up here in this discussion. Here's, Sorry. sure. Uh, on that last one. The years on the other side, um, was that off of the actual? So that's still the daily maximum over there. Oops, I hit a button. Um, which part, Aaron? Like the highest, that's based off the daily max, not. Okay. Or is that, is that? This is a, it's a different part. The extremes is the highest and lowest temperatures measured per month of the entire period of record. I will get back to that one more coming up. Um, this is an analysis of the trends over basically that century. They found no change in the daily maximum or the daily mean temperatures over that period of record. So statistically, the daily maximums have not been increasing. 
the same with the daily mean values. However, daily minimums have increased 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit since 2011. So the trend has been our hots aren't necessarily hotter, but our colds are not as cold as they used to be over the last 100 years. Um, the 2.8 degrees increase is averaged over the 12 months. When we look at increases per month, it's different. And I'll have a, a present uh, slide next to describe that. But basically, the coldest months, January, February, have warmed faster than the mean. Um, when Hannah or all the other employees at the experimental forest go out, one of the things they measure is new snow per day. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so it doesn't have a water content value, but it's just if she goes out at five and there's two inches of new snow, that gets recorded, right? Okay. So there's been about nine days less over the century with one inch of snow or more. So warming temperatures, warmer minimums, less snow. Uh, a few other little tidbits of looking at all these things. During the day, a lapse rate of four degrees per thousand feet. So it would be a thou or four degrees colder every thousand feet you go up the mountain there. Seems to make sense, right? Is that year round or just in the Not sure. We'll have to read the book. Um, this is a look at the increase of the daily minimum temperatures over each of the 12 months. Um, like as I alluded to earlier, January and February are the first two. Um, the, the scale here is temperature increases in degrees Fahrenheit per year. It's easy math because we're talking about a century, so you multiply it by 100. Um, so January and February minimums have increased six degrees Fahrenheit over the century. Um, this line in the middle is that 2.8 degree average over the 12 months. And so you can see these uh, spring months are right at the 2.8, but October and November um, haven't hardly changed at all for the daily minimums for those months. But um, for January and February, the the minimums have increased about six degrees. So, uh, this is back to the right hand side of that table we we're looking at. This is the extremes of the pe period of record. These are not averages, these are just the daily temperatures that were the hottest or the coldest of that 100 years. And this one is the most startling to me, um, this, this info. We think about our kids and what's coming. Um, but this was printed in 2015, which is more than two years ago. At the time of publication, um, January and February had uh, record highs recorded in the early 2000s of 50 and 71. So at the time of publication, those were printed. But I've been keeping track because I bug people like Hannah about what's happened since 2015. Um, you can see these dates are for the, so for instance, the, the high of record at time of printing for the month of June was 97 degrees and it was set in 2012. Um, the rest of these are kind of all over the board in the 60s and the 80s and the 20s and the 30s, et cetera. Um, at the time of printing, the all-time high was 103 degrees, and that was recorded in August of 1961. So August of 61 had uh, the, the all-time high for that period. Since 2015, uh, we've had several of these records broken. So in 2018, we got a temperature of 105 in August that broke the record that held for 60 years. And then 2021 came. We've heard about 2021 in the previous presentations where 
Joe presented a bunch of info about the fisheries data. We heard from Rob Ryan about water temperatures in the Priest River. Well, the air temperatures here would match that. Um, in 2021, we got new records for July and June. And our all-time high at time of publication was 103. We broke it in 2018, and then we broke it again in 2021. June of 21 was 108 degrees. So that was the hottest temperature ever recorded at that place in that century in change that we're paying attention. So, so the, the daily maximum is a recording thermometer. So it's, measure, it's red at 5 p.m., but if the high was at 3 p.m. or 9 a.m., it would all be, yeah. But it doesn't tell you the time. Correct. It tells you how high it's high. Mm-hmm. So, and then 2021 kept up its press. And December of 21 set a new all-time high for the month of December. So um, the startling part to me, even though there has been no statistical increase in daily maximums over that 100 years, we have set record high temps for six of our 12 months in the last 20 years. 2023 to 2021, um, we have six monthly record highs in the last 20 years where the rest of those records are scattered throughout the, you know, the, the decades. And this one for the three, 2015, some of that was through 2012. Say that again, please. This data goes through 2015, the report, or is it? The report, the report, let's see here. The DTR was through 2015. But I doubt it's going to go 25 or 12. Yeah. Or 13. Okay. No records. Okay. But yeah, so the 2015 publication looked at this data set for temperature. You're good at catching details because each of these things we look at tonight, different periods were analyzed because we don't have 100 years of stream flow yet. And even some of the data sets use different time scales for different reasons. Okay. She's a noticer. Okay, because so. The fact that in the last 20 years, we had six record high sets. Yeah. Because even though they were reported on that old report. And that's the part, all the ones in orange here, mm -hmm. these are all post-publication in 2015. Yeah, and those other three happened to be at the final publication. Yeah. We only had two months set since 2000 at time of publication, and now we've got six months set. So. Um, the record lows I've been covering up because our most recent record low was 1968. There's been no record low temperatures for any of the months since 1968. When is the expected new publication for this projected? Hannah, when's the next expected publication for... <laughs> um, I don't know. It's really not been that long since 2015, right? Like these are, are nice at intervals that have a meaningful look back. Um, 30 years before this right. But if we take all the data we have since publication with all these records, yeah. perhaps now there is a statistically significant increase in daily maximum. There wasn't in 2015, but now that we have that 2021 nonsense, um, maybe it would. <clears throat> so anyway, this is the one with temperatures that is like, whew, past 20 years we have, we have um, repeatedly measured the all-time high for that area. Um, this is a graph of frost-free days. Hannah doesn't know if there's frost that, morning, that afternoon or morning or not, but this is derived from the temperature data. Um, any day that did not go below 32 degrees. We can have frost plus or minus that, but this was just a, a ecological 
value derived from the temperature. So there's 20 more frost-free days per year than 1911. So it's not all bad, I was thinking, because it was probably pretty tough to grow tomatoes there in 1911, but yeah, you can maybe grow tomatoes now. So trying to stay positive here, right? So the Canadian farmers are really up on this because they now have a longer growing season. They can grow different wheat crops than they used to be able to grow. So Hannah, maybe you're missing some economic opportunities here. I don't know what we can grow there, but. Tomorrow we'll have to start selling those seeds. Yeah. And yeah. these are mostly in the months of April and May, those additional frost-free days. What's the elevation of this site? Um, around 2,000 feet, and I'll have that later on. I think it's 2,300 feet yeah. above sea level. So yeah. that line on the graph looks so consistent. Can you extrapolate another 10 year about it going so straight to where we are now? Yeah, the days are regression lines that are fit to the data set. So I'm, I assume you could extrapolate this with some. Um, a, a good scientist would not. Right. You would get a new data set and then you'd fit a new re regression line. Those of us that aren't scientists might. Yeah. yeah, well, that's one of the problems that you run into these when you show some of this stuff. Like in public, technically, scientifically, you do not extrapolate, you interpolate. You only go between your your end of your your lines. I mean, I learned that because a lot of times, if there's something funny going on, well, what what they do if you stop there in what's that about 1975, where that real high point is? If you'd have drawn a line there, it would have been way steeper. Because all this data on the right side would have been gone. And so then you would extrapolate it way up, and you'd have us at 100 or 500 degree days or cross three days in a year. Yeah. There are some cautions about doing that. The, the line comes from the data you have. And um, there's linear regressions to fit to your data, and there's polynomial and others that are ways to fit a trend line into the data you have that fits. And there's some mathematical rules that tell you which one works or doesn't. Um, so for instance, if you have more high temperatures near the end of your data set, it might not be a linear. It might be like a curved line, right? So, but we could probably make some guesses as to where that's going. But the probability is Right. Uh, moving on to precipitation. It's getting more exciting. Uh, the average annual precip collected at that weather station is 31.4 inches with a standard deviation of 5.6. Um, standard deviation means the, the data typically varies plus or minus 5.6 inches from that 31.4. But within the period of record of 100 years of measure in precip, the lowest was 16 inches of precip in a year, and then the highest was uh, 47 inches per year. And so those values are about plus or minus 50% of the average. But typically, um, we're within five inches of precip of the mean. 40% uh, of our precipitation comes in the months of November, December, and January. Those are our wettest months, accounting for nearly half of our annual precip. And then our droughty summers, July, August, and September, only 13% come during those months. And then the remaining 37% comes in the rest of the months of the year. But we all know falls and winters, we get most of our precip um, at those times of year. Um, Benton Spring is one of our snow courses I'll talk more about. It's located on Gisborne Mountain, which is on the Experimental Forest. It's uh, due east of the weather station. It's at 4,800 feet elevation, and it averages 13.5% more precip catch per year than at the control station of about 2,400 feet. So, 
Okay. Um, so we all know we get more precip as we go up mountains. Um, at least it seems that way. But here it's roughly um, about four inches more uh, precip up high. When analyzed over the century, there's no statistically significant trend. We're not getting more or less precip. It's been consistent. But as you guys are probably already surmising, with the increase in minimum temperatures, more of our precip is coming as rain instead of snow. And uh, there's some data coming up to speak to that. Okay, another program that has been happening at the Experimental Forest since 2003, 20 years, is uh, a station there that is part of a National Atmospheric Deposition Program. So it is uh, precipitation chemistry. And if you wanted to Google this, <clears throat> uh, Google National Trends Network. I know less about this, but that doesn't keep me from talking about it, so bear with me. But uh, this website, um, it's managed by University of Wisconsin. In the publication, this program was managed by University of Illinois. But when I was Googling it, preparing for this, uh, that website in the print does, doesn't work. The National Trends Network still comes up with a search but it's now managed by University of Wisconsin. It's uh, nationwide. It's actually more than nationwide. I think there's sites in Canada and maybe Mexico. So it's like a, seems to be a North American study. And on the website, there's an interactive map, there's site-specific data, and then there's summary products about um, what's in our rain. Uh, like I said, I don't know much about it, but I think we have clean air. There's some summary products on that website. I just stole one. We're up here in this nice green area. Take that, Illinois. Um, I think red is worse than green. This one here, I can't even read it. Um, inorganic nitrogen wet, deposi wet dip deposition. So basically different uh, compounds that can be in air, a lot from industrial areas, things like that. But um, I've also heard anecdotally over the years, I think up here we have some of the cleanest air in the nation uh, in general. And then uh, this is some data if you go to the website and the map, you just zoom in on Idaho and there's the options. You can click on the pin and it brings you to this, which is the experimental forest site. And this is pH. Uh, you can't see it, but there is different sulfates and nitrates and ammonium, magnesium, different, a handful of elements they analyze for. Uh, is it weekly? Mm -hmm. So this data is sent in weekly. Um, what I should say is this is the device in the nursery at the Experimental Forest. It has a little automated lid, so when it rains, it, it covers the dry bucket and collects the wet deposition, and so it's, pretty stringent, and I think they have pretty stringent rules about what data works or doesn't to be posted. So it's a 20-year data set for those that are interested. And I apologize if none of you are, and I'm still droning on about this. Uh, this pH looks like it varies widely over the years. Hard to see. This is 2004 to 2020. It looks like it varies, but the scale is small. This is like 5.3 to 5.5, so it looks like it varies, but it's a relatively small range for those years, and it very similar to pHs of precipitation in a lot of other places. What's yes? 5.3, what are they measuring? 5.3. This is pH. Oh, so on the spot with the 7.0 being? Neutral. You got it. So precip is slightly acidic. Uh, moving to snowpack. I'm going to use a few different terms here. Bear with me. Uh, we talk about snowfall, which doesn't have a water content associated with it. Snowpack, we can measure some with water content. Peter, I think our next presenter is going to tell us all about that. 
and I'm going to ruin a little bit of it for him. So, uh, but there's two snow courses on the experimental forest. One is next to the office and weather station that you've seen photos of, and I'll tell you more about them in a moment. Though 2,300 foot elevation there, and then Benton Spring on Gisborne Mountain is a snow course at 4,800 feet elevation. Um, these were established in 1937. We measure them once per month, uh, within a few days of the first of the month starting in January. So just a few bits. Um, this analysis looks at the snowpacks of March 1st for those 70-something um, years we have because our peak snow is sometime after March 1st, before May. So they, the authors chose March 1st as near peak to look at it over the, over the data set. We do these cooperative with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So the numbers we measure, we report to um, some folks that compile it with other data and get some cool publications and data. Did you see this, Peter? He took this photo, so whose tracks were those? <laughs> so this is one of the monthly products they produce and I hope I'm correct with this, the data we present goes into the, in, in some of the cool maps they produce monthly for us is like how our annual precip is looking for these different basins and what the snowpack is like compared to a median value for all the different basins in Idaho. So some of the numbers we collect here go into some of these bigger um, publications, bigger look. And then within these reports, he has all these cool ways of presenting how this year's snowpack is looking compared to normal and whatnot. If you need something to talk about or show off to your friends at the coffee shop before you go skiing or snowmobiling or something, you could argue with some of the data they provide. Um, the snow courses are a, um, a standardized methodology of how you measure the water content in snow still low tech. Peter's probably gonna talk about some higher tech stuff that's going on out there, but these two are low tech. Um, it's a snow tube, aluminum tube that's calibrated. You drive it down into the snowpack and you weigh it with a scale that's calibrated to inches of liquid water in that tube. So if you have fluffy snow and it's four feet deep, It'll have like, let's say a water content of eight inches. If you have really dense snow at four feet deep, you might have a water content of 15 inches. So it's measuring the water content in the snowpack regardless of how the, the density may be. Would that be as if the snow were to melt, then how many inches it will work? Yeah. The water equivalent would probably go up. Yeah. Because the, the snow is the snow with water. Right. So when you can take a snowpack that, you can I have an idea of how you can understand it better. You can come with us this winter. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, so basically, regardless of how fluffy or dense your snowpack is, you are measuring the, the liquid equivalent. So it's, it's kind of a consistent metric of your snowpack. And that's the important part of when it comes to spring runoff time and how much water would be available for our reservoirs, rivers, et cetera. A um, couple historic photos. This is kind of fun. This is on the south face of Gisborne. This is 1950s. This is one of the cool contraptions they had. Yeah, they've got some. Yep, and I got a more modern photo. Can someone tell me what is similar between these two photos? Tracks. Tracks? They're both stuck. Some things change. This new high tech UTV four wheel drive tracks, heated seats, whatever. They're both stuck. And 
and then the work begins. So the, I kind of detect a smirk on that guy. <laughs> it's because they just got started in extracting that thing, I'm sure. So anyway, um, some things change, some things stay the same, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, that can happen quick sometimes. Yeah, what it doesn't show is the slope on the other side is 70% down 2,000 feet. <laughs> Just go over there and you won't be stuck in here. Yeah. yeah, I'm guessing there's a shovel somewhere up here that probably got used more than anything else. I don't know what good the ax would do in this particular, but anyway, fun old photo. So this is back to the snowfall term. This is just new snow measured at 5 p.m. each day. Um, over the, so this goes back farther than our snow courses. This is part of the daily weather measurements. Uh, low elevation snowfall has declined by 20 inches per year. So with those increase in minimum temps, it's no surprise to know that more of our snow or more of our precip comes as rain instead of snow. Uh, the snow pack, back to speaking to snow water content. Um, this acronym here, SWE, is snow water equivalent. It's back to that, what is the liquid equivalent of your snow pack? So it's kind of neat to think at least how I like to think about it is if you measure your snowpack and it shows 12 inches of liquid water, you try to picture that stuck to all the surfaces and just kind of hovering in place. Um, that's what our snowpack would be holding. So at the Benton Meadow site, which is the low elevation site, snow depth and snow water equivalent at March 1st over that period of record um, have been declining. And over the 70 something years, uh, there's a 30% less water in the snowpack at March 1st. So our precip was consistent as we previously spoke about, but our March 1st snowpack is 30% less, which means we're getting that pre more precip as rain. Um, at the higher elevation site at 4,800 feet Benton Spring, the March 1st snowpack has a, the regression line has a negative slope, but there's no significant, no statistically significant decline. And these are two uh, graphs in that publication that show that. Um, it's, the lines don't show up here. One of them is dashed and one is solid, but they both look solid to me. In the print and the PDFs, it shows up better, but uh, basically the lower one is the low elevation site. The snowpack is always less down there. Um, this one is March 1st snow water equivalent. The one on top is March 1st snow depth. Um, but that's the, the decline in snow water equivalent since 1937. We don't have 100 years of this one yet. So you're saying your previous slide said that that solid line on the bottom is statistically significant, but the dotted line above it is not, even though Visually, those slopes look pretty similar. Uh, close. The, the decline in snow water content in the low elevation site is statistically significant, 30% decline. Right. The Benton Meadow site is not statistically significant. So I think, yes, I think to answer your question, they look similar, but when you do the statistical tests, right. the high elevation site well, is not. You can see the, the greater variability in the it jumps around more. Yeah, it might. And that makes a big difference. So take away, we're certain there's a 30% decline at the low elevation. There is no, we're not certain there's been a decline at the higher elevation. I think your snow builders would agree with that because in fewer, fewer than three, three years that we can get to the high elevation because there's no snow running on it. We've got enough snow to get the snow builds up into the higher elevations. I've complained and complained to Peter in the NRCS where we have a bias of measuring snow at the high elevations and we don't. Um, I'm sure he would do something about it if he could, but yeah, we pay attention at the high elevations. It's where the most of our water stays here, but 
yeah, our low elevation sites, we have a bias because we don't have as many measurements down there. Who are you who are you're, you're doing the data for? NRCS isn't doing snow data for snow fields. They're doing it for runoff for power production and agriculture. And everybody. Peter, putting you on the spot a little bit, like Benton Meadow is 2,300 feet. How many other sites do you track that are lower elevation that you can think of? Are there a handful? So in, in the uh, Priest River Basin, so we actually don't have any snow fell sites that low. Our lowest snow fell site is around 5,000 feet. We have a number of other snow courses that are kind of closer to around 4,000 feet. Um, but you're, you're correct in that uh, the main focus on how they designed the network in the past was more for water supply forecasting for things like hydroelectric generation and agriculture and things like that. Yeah. And the way the snow accumulates here, I don't know the number, but 10% is probably 2,000 feet to 3,000. And, you know, the, by and large, the bulk is up high. But we are missing what's happening down low to some degree. Okay, moving on to stream flow. Um, Benton Creek is one of the two named drainages in the experimental forest. It's the southern one. Canyon Creek is to the north. Uh, Benton Creek has a gauging dam. I got some photos coming up that we have stream flow records since 1939. It's uh, almost a thousand acres of drainage area above the dam. The elevations in that little small watershed range from about 2,000 to just over a mile high elevation. Average peak flow at that gauging dam over the course of the year is seven cubic feet per second. I think there's about seven gallons per cubic foot. So just for a reference. In 1997 was the highest flow on record for that dam. Those that were here, that was quite the winter I've heard. Actually, 96, 90, 95, 96, 96, 97. Well, yep. Double whammy there. And then we know what the precipitation is because we collect that. Obviously, you have to make an educated guess of what it is for that watershed because it ranges from 2,000 to over a mile high. We know precipitation increases. But this is a neat deal when you measure all the annual runoff. It's about 17 inches of water distributed across that entire area, which is 51% of the precipitation, which means the rest of the water, which doesn't go away, evaporates, is transpired by the vegetation, or seeps into groundwater. So when you're looking at a creek here, about half comes out as runoff, and the rest is moved through the system in another way. A uh, picture of the gauging dam. This is, uh, there's some wooden baffles. The creek comes down this way. And uh, this is the ponded area behind the small concrete dam. It's got some weirs. And we have a way to measure flow based on a height of water that goes over these weirs. And so off to the right here is a stilling well where the water heights are measured and recorded. Uh, here's a picture, oblique Google Earth photo. The experimental forest buildings are down here. This is looking east, and the watershed boundary is this uh, dark line. Gisborne Mountain with the lookout is there, and uh, that's the, the gauge watershed. Brandon, was that, was that a fixed area? Yes. And here's a picture of it during spring flow. This weir is smaller and narrower, and it is set lower in the dam than the broad crested weir. This allows us to get more accurate measurements at lower flows, and then at higher flows, this one is added to this one. So that allows you to get more accurate readings year round and then also accommodate that once a year flush that's much bigger. This is the hydrograph of the average hydrograph for that site. Um, the months are across the bottom and stream flow in cubic feet per second is, is on this vertical axis. 
And this is very typical of what our streams look like in the mountain country. Snow accumulates, accumulates starting here in October, November, and then starts to melt, which responds in a spring runoff event as the snow melts. So very typical. Has that peak shifted? Good question. I will answer that in a few slides. Okay. Is everybody else doing okay? Okay. Just the education, the 2,500? Is that, no, no, 20, uh, what is, what is that 40? I bet you it is around 2,400 feet. I might have had a wrong number there. Because, yeah, if the weather station's 2,400, I bet you it's probably somewhere in there. Um, okay, a couple of factoids. Peak flow is usually midway, mid-May. Lowest flows of the year be begin in early October, and that's typical for around here. Um, the flow during April and May account for half of the annual stream flow at the site. So if you take the area uh, below this graph, so from April up to May, something like that, that's 40% of the annual stream flow at this site. So we know that spring flows are when it all comes off. So September and October, those two months account for less than 4% of the annual stream flow. So low flows are pretty minimal in regards to the annual amount. And then the spring is when you get it. Not super convenient always. Okay, so variability has increased since that 1983 publication. In 1983, this is uh, annual stream flow in inches of uh, distributed across that watershed. It's not CFS anymore, it's, it's inches deep across the whole watershed. In 1983, the period of record had a minimum of six dry year and a max of 25 inches, um, that volume of water. When this was reanalyzed in 2015, the max and mins had both increased. So when, when the look back was done in 2015, the time of this publication, the lowest year was now 4.6 inches and the max was 33.5. So that variability of what we get off the hill uh, through the stream has increased. Um, when analyzed, they found a 33% increase in average annual runoff over the course of the period of record. Uh, this one's a bit confusing. I'll speak to that a bit. Um, this shows streamflow hydrographs per decade, and it speaks to the variability. You can see, like, it's hard to see the the top and bottom of these um, peaks, they're kind of widening out, showing that the, the distance between these, as the decades progress, the variability is increasing more so than the, the earlier decades. So more flashy flows. So this is the question you asked as when is that peak flow per at each year? Um, you can only know this when you look back. You wait till sometime in summer, and then you look back on your chart as to when that high flow was, and then you find the date. Um, so this one is, an, just before Aaron calls me out on this, this one was analyzed over 60 years, and I don't know why. I think there were some, there were some missing data through that period of record for stream flow. I think during some war years when they had trouble finding employees, some may have been destroyed or lost, but, but over the last 60 years, the stream flow is, the peak stream flow of the year has been 19 days earlier. Well, now, I'm, now there's a 50 years too. I think I got that from the pub, so I'm not sure which values they use, but I'll stick to this statement. The stream flow, the peak stream flow has been 19 days earlier in the past 50 years. So early on in the 50s, it was right around mid-May 
and now we're kind of, you know, end of April. A uh, little bit of discussion about this. This found increased stream flow back to the consistent precip. No measurable increase in precip, but stream flow. Uh, most of the research in this realm is showing decreasing, pre, decreasing runoff per year Western US wide. So this finding is 180 degrees contrary to what the bulk of research is finding. So a little bit confusing. There's a few out there that may have found some similar results, other researchers. Uh, canopy hasn't changed. There hasn't been a significant amount of timber harvest or other disturbances in that to account for things. Um, authors surmised it may be change of um, habit, uh, species of trees. I spoke to a researcher as well that worked there for a long time and he believes there's some instrumentation error uh, involved with the data record. So don't know. Uh, last slide or almost last slide, you guys are doing great. Just a quick recap. Temperatures, no change in daily maximum or daily mean, but the daily minimum temps have increased. And again, record high temps for six of the 12 months have been set in the last 20 years. Um, no change of precip, but more as rain. Um, snowpack, low elevation snowpack at March 1st has declined 30% water content in that snowpack. And uh, stream flow, this publication shows an increase over that period of record, more variability and uh, later peak flows, which kind of makes sense. Um, one thing, these are all numbers that were measured of those amount of precip. There's a lot of ecological and biological effects of these changes, like uh, warmer air carries more moisture. So perhaps if it's warmer, you know, we're, we have a greater drying effect of things, vegetation and everything. Um, the timing of flows is changing, the timing of peak flows with regards how fish respond to that or not. And then one thing I was reading is uh, in regards to the snowpack, I was reading about reindeer herds in Greenland or Iceland, somewhere in Scandinavia country there. They haven't measured so much changes in quantity of precip or snow, but their snowpack is different. And they've had instances of reindeer starving because instead of the snow coming in cold weather and staying fluffy as it accumulates, they're having crusts. They're having periods of warm in their winter that are creating crusts, which are making it hard for the animals to forage. Um, on the lichens or whatever reindeer eat. So there's a lot of things happening as a result of the changes in the numbers and we're all working, a lot of people here are working to try to figure out some of those things, but. Um. I have a question. Um, so like when you get rain on snow events, well, are those increasing, do we know? Like more of our winter? Imagine they are. Things like it. Does that turn into runoff more? Because it seems like I think it going down into the soil. So would that increase runoffs? Yep. And when you have rain coming in March instead of snow, if it came as snow, it hangs around a while, right? When it comes as rain, it probably does enter the system, soils. And so you probably have, if we put up that hydrograph, you probably have more of that volume of water is moving through the system earlier and out because it's coming as snow and it's, or coming as rain and it's not hanging around for weeks or months and then leaving in a, in a fashion. So yes, all of that is happening. But my last slide also has this on there. I'm open to questions, but I'm happy to hear some answers too for some of this, so. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. I can send you electronic, just a reminder, I can send electronic copies of either publication, the 1983 or the 2015. 
Um, if you put your name on that list in back, I can email that to you in a couple days. If you Google a couple things that the experimental forest people have been working on, I wanted to highlight. Uh, if you Google the Priest River Experimental Forest story map, they've built a cool story map, which is, oh, that's an interactive map that includes a list of things that happen at the experimental forest. And it, as you go through the stories, there's photos. And if you click on the photos, it highlights the pin of where the photo is at. So it's kind of a neat way to go through some of the things they're working on. And I thought that was pretty cool. And then the photos that I've presented in here if you go to the University of Idaho Library digital collections and search for it, there's hundreds of photos that have been taken over the century at the Experimental Forest that you can check out, which are pretty cool. And uh, those are available online at the University of Idaho Library. And you guys are great. Thank you for letting me drone on, and I'm happy to take some questions. Yes? So precipitation is happening later in the form of rain, is that right? And my question is, has the change had any effect on wildfire? I would say that the evidence and the research suggests that, yes. Wild, extreme wildfire events are more frequent and they're bigger, so I think, yes, there's, there's some correlations there. Here on the experimental forest, can't speak to that, but just Western US wide, I think that's, uh, I think there's a lot of high tech and research and publications that would say yes, wildfire intensities are increasing over more acres. Sure seems like it, doesn't it? Sean. So I'm a little confused. And uh, I'm not surprised. It's not necessarily unusual, but will you go back to your summary slide? Yes. So under stream flow, last part of that, and later seasonal peak flows. Now, if you'll go back two more slides, maybe. Doesn't doesn't that show that the peak flows are occurring earlier? Yes. Yeah. Did I say it wrong? You just have a typo in that. Yeah. Thank you. Surprise Aaron didn't catch that earlier. Thank you, Sean. This was the last darn slide I did, too. I'm like, good, I'm done. I'm ready. So yes, thanks, Sean. The timing of peak flows has happened earlier each year. Thank you. I, I said it wrong. Can we go back to the video and edit out those uh, errors, or am I stuck stating them on record? Okay. <laughs> but you corrected them. So <laughs> okay. Thank you. But good catch, Sean. Um, this is a photo I took uh, last winter. Kind of, kind of a neat. This is the office with the porch light on, and there's snow berms, so the light ended up looking kind of like a keyhole at night. So I thought it was kind of neat. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. <laughs> One thing, like if you are a gambler or invest, want to invest in a company, there's usually disclaimers that say past performance is no guarantee of future performance. This was just a look back at the last 100 years, and it's hard to predict what's coming, right? So got some good ideas, but who knows what's coming in the next 100 years. My name is Peter Youngblood, uh, and I work for the NRCS Idaho Snow Survey. So we are part of the, the USDA, and it's broken down at, at the state level. Um, fun fact, just about three years ago, we all used to be based entirely out of Boise, um, and which served to be a, quite a challenge because we have to get to all of our snow tell sites, uh, which are these automated weather stations up in the mountains, at least once a year. So we would have to make big, long road trips. Um, every single year to get up to these further out basins and, and actually do some maintenance. Um, also, one of the benefits of having us up here is that I could be here with you all tonight. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And, and thank you all for being here and, and for inviting me. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about 
uh, I'm going to start out at a little bit higher level, talk about just snowpack across the western US and why we care about snow so much. Then I'll kind of zoom in a little bit more and talk about some of the resources that are in your basin, both the snow tell sites and snow courses that are used to, to predict the amount of runoff that comes from your basin every single year. Um, and then I'll also uh, finish off the talk by talking about some of the tools that we have available for everybody here um, to be able to look at what the current conditions are up in the mountains and also be able to take a look at what kind of stream flow you're going to have for the year and, and a bunch of other really cool things. So I think you'll, you'll find some really helpful tools there. So I guess here's a, a, a quick outline. Um, and one couple of pictures I'd like to point out here, that's uh, Brandon uh, Glaza going up to do a snow course <laughs> there. Uh, I'm just kidding, that's uh, Dr. Frank Church, or uh, uh, it'll come to me. I can't, can't believe I forgot his name right now, but uh, that's the founder of the, the snow survey right, right there. Um, and then on the, the right-hand side, another more local picture uh, up at Medellin Falls before it was inundated by the, uh, the, the dam that they put up at, at the boundary uh, with Canada. So I always like to start with this figure because it, it kind of helps paint the picture for why snow is so important in the West. Uh, this is a map showing annual precipitation across our entire country. Uh, and a couple things, a couple observations you might make right off the bat is that in the, the East Coast, there's a lot more of these cooler colors, so the greens and blues and purples, uh, that, that represent more precipitation. And out West, you could see a lot more warmer colors, uh, which indicates lesser precipitation. With these small pockets up here, let's see if I can figure out the laser pointer, uh, small pockets, and you might identify those as some of the bigger mountain ranges that we have out here in the West. One other thing that this map doesn't really show is that the, the timing of this precipitation. So out east, they receive a lot more precipitation throughout the year. Um, and when I say precipitation, I'm talking both rain, snow, wintry mix, anything that falls in between. Um, out west, we receive a majority of our precipitation in the wintertime, uh, as, as Brandon pointed out a little bit earlier. So with that, it, it should come as no surprise that a majority of the, the runoff that we get in our streams and that fills our reservoirs and canals uh, comes from snowmelt. And in fact, a number of studies have identified that it's about 75% of our runoff comes from snowmelt. And over here on the map, you'll see all these blue highlighted areas, and those are areas that are uh, dominated by snowmelt runoff for water supply. And that includes a majority of Idaho and, and most of the area up here as well. Just to zoom in a little bit more, uh, a little bit further, um, this is a map showing uh, percent of runoff from snow. And, and this is the Ponderay Basin, sorry, it's a little cut off there at the top, but we get about 70 or 68% of uh, runoff from snow. Looking at the, the Spokane River Basin here, uh, we get about 69%, or sorry, 60% uh, of uh, runoff from snow. So we are snow melt dominated basins and watersheds here. All righty, so that, that kind of paints the picture for why we might want to be able to measure uh, the snowpack here in the, uh, in the Western US. Um, and I think this quote by Mark Twain uh, paints the picture perfectly. Uh, Whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. Um, and, as settlers came out west and as pioneers came out west, they, they aptly realized that we needed to build water infrastructure such as canals and dams to be able to capture this water as it runs off in the springtime to, to build our civilization out west and to be able to do things like farm when we don't get rain all year round, so we need to be able to use that water that flows off. But as time went on and, and civilization grew, they realized that they needed to be able to make more informed decision making on, on how to manage that water, how much to let flow through, how much to try to capture so that we could be able to have a more productive society. Yes, Brandon. Were the first snow courses East Coast or were they in the Mount West? Great question. Um, so they were actually down uh, in the, the Sierra Nevada range. Um, and that, that was by James Church. And please don't tell anybody at the snow survey, I called him Frank Church earlier, because that was a, a big slip. Um, so in the early 1900s, uh, James Church was a professor at UNR down in Reno. 
And at the time, there were certain years where they over allocated water and there wasn't enough water to, to be able to uh, irrigate cropland. Um, and there, all, there were also other years where they captured too much water and people's crop or pe people's property actually ended up getting flooding or getting flooded. Um, so they needed to be able to predict how much is going to flow down the mountains every single year. And in 1908, James Church established the first snow courses in Sierra Nevada, and those snow courses are still being measured today. What's a snow course? Thank you. That's a great question. The difference <laughs> between snow towns and snow um, So I'll get there in, in just a couple slides, but they're basically these transects where people go out, uh, like uh, Brandon and Hannah, to go out and measure the, the snowpack each, each month. And I'll talk a little bit more about what they're measuring and what those look like. Um, and then another thing you'll see here is uh, Snowtel. Uh, and that's just a more, uh, a newer version that's automated and we take hourly measurements. Um, so I'll, I'll explain all that here in just a little bit. But here's an example of the, the first snow sampler, which looks identical to the one that we use today. Um, we've got a snow scale right there, which as, as Brandon mentioned earlier, it takes the weight of the snow in that tube, this tube right here, and uh, converts that directly into inches of water. Um, so in 1908, he went out and measured, established these snow courses and measured them for, I think it was about three years before he was able to very accurately predict the amount of water running off every year. And it was so successful that by 1935, Congress formed the, the Snow Survey and Water Supply Forecasting Program. By the mid-1960s, uh, we, have, we had more technology and we were able to do that on an hourly basis without sending somebody out in the field every single month to, to measure that. And back in this day, uh, this is an old snow surveyor, I think this was from like 1910 or something like that. They would actually have to hike out and, and stay in these cabins for sometimes months at a time to, to continually measure that. So it was quite an adventurous job. I'm a little jealous I, I don't do that, but I'm also very happy because that sounds pretty brutal. So what, what are we measuring? Um, I think that's a, a common misconception is that we go out and we just measure the depth of snow. But as we all know intuitively, snow comes in so many different types. You know, some days you go out there and it's practically slush. It's so dense, it has a lot of water in it. Um, and other days it's really cold out and you get this cold smoke is what they call it. Great for skiing, very, very light. Um, and, and there's a lot of differences between those two things, but what we're focused on is the amount of water that's stored in that snow, or snow water equivalent. So I think the best way to, to visualize this is if you imagine a, a, a block of snow here that's 10 inches tall at 20% density, and snow can range anywhere from 5% roughly up to 40 or 50% density, um, and I won't go into all the reasons why it's constrained to those different densities, but if you were to melt this down, you'd get about two inches of water. And the math is pretty simple. So 10 inches of snow times that 20%, two inches of water. So if you were to imagine 10 inches of 20% snow across the whole basin, melt that down, you have two inches of water covering that whole area. And this is how we, we first started measuring it, and this is how we continue to measure it at snow courses across the west. So here's a schematic of the, the snow tubes. Right here you'll see a little bit of a jagged edge on the, at the end of that tube, and that's what we drive into the snow. And that jagged edge cuts through the snow and ice layers, and it also holds a core sample of the snow in those tubes. So depending on how deep the snowpack is, you screw together mul multiple of these sections. Um, this, is, this set has five, but I've seen them go all the way up to eight sections for really deep snowpack. Um, here's a snow scale right there, and then this is just a driving wrench, which you'll see in a picture here, but it just helps us be able to drive that through some of those harder to get ice layers. Uh, I think they're like 30 inches a section. Yeah, th this one's about 30 inches, and, and that's a standard set. Um, shoot, we could have brought ours in today. We were actually just measuring snow. <laughs> uh, so, Here's, here's basically the procedure. Screw together a bunch of sections. This guy's measuring a very deep snowpack, so he's got a really tall tube. And that's, it's a lot of work to, to be able to pull that snow out and sample that. Um, so you take that snow tube, you hold it 
uh, vertical or perpendicular to the snow surface. You drive it in in a twisting motion to help it cut through all the snow and ice. And then when you pull that out, it, it retains a core of, of the ice inside of that, that instrument right there. Um, with that, you put that on a snow scale, as you can see here. Take that measurement and record it in, our, in the, the snow notes. Um, every single month in the winter time from January through June for some sites, uh, cooperators, NRCS employees, ranchers, anybody we can get to go out and measure these things uh, will record this information and send it to us and we're the people that put that into our databases and I'll show you ways to access that here in just a little bit. And so here's a picture of what a snow course looks like. So you can see these X marks uh, are where we'll roughly sample and we have these, these posts that are permanent so we never move them. Uh, which is really important because you want to consistently take the measurement at the same spot. Um, so you go out and you take one measurement per post and then you take the average of, of those measurements and that's how we get a, uh, an idea of, of what the snowpack is like in that area. And the other thing y'all might intuitively know is that uh, snow can be very variable. Um, so you might have a snow drift in one spot where it's a lot deeper um, or you might have an area where it's kind of scoured out and that's why we take a whole transect to be able to, to get a better idea of what that snowpack is like. So you're visiting this spot five or six times over the course of the winter, and obviously you're not putting, you know, how, you can't be so spatially precise that you put your sampling thing in the same spot that you just were, or you'll get a bunch of empty space, right? Exactly, yeah, so we kind of have a, a little bit of a buffer where, where we put that, uh, the sampler in. Yeah, and, and sometimes you end up hitting that hole and, and you pull it out. And uh, the way we, we do checks to make sure we're taking good measurements is that we look at the snow density. So the density should be relatively consistent between all five samples. Where you might have multiple different depths, the density should be consistent. So within 5% of each, me each measurement there. And what usually happens is the first one you measure will vary by the time you get to the last one, so then you have to walk all the way back to the last one, the first one. You know, right? For sure, and you end up chasing your tail sometimes too, just to get that within 5%. So this is the more modern version of a snow course, and it's basically a, a fancy weather station that's uh, up, in, up in the higher elevations, up in the mountains. Um, a standard snow tail site has a few different things. It has a precipitation gauge, which just collects that rain or snow as it falls throughout the year. Every year we have to go up and flush these gauges so they don't overflow. It also has a snow depth sensor up here, which sends out a sound wave that bounces off the, the snow surface and we can measure the depth of snow using that. And it has a snow pillow. And what a snow pillow is, it's basically, it's like the, the material that whitewater rafts are made out of, that, that kind of a thick, PVC type material, not exactly sure what it's made of. Uh, but it's a big, big bag of antifreeze, environmentally friendly antifreeze, uh, important to note. Um, and as the snow accumulates on top of that, you can imagine it putting more and more pressure on that surface. And we're able to, we have a line plumbed from there up into our shelter, and we can measure that pressure difference over time and calculate how much that SWE is, or that snow water equivalent. Uh, another standard things that we have at snow tail sites are temperature sensors and ground truth markers. So that's where so surveyors can go up and double check that the data is correct. That's actually what Cody and I were doing up at Schweitzer today. Um, so those are the, the standard things that you'd see at snow tail sites. One thing I do wanna note though is that we're always looking for ways to improve our sites and we work very closely with modelers, um, like people who are modeling atmospheric processes and also modeling snowpack across the West. Uh, so we're, we're working to install more enhanced sensors such as solar radiation, wind sensors. Um, we also have uh, snow temperature sensors and all, a, a lot of other sensors that we are installing and testing right now. Do you manually measure the, the snowpack at these sites occasionally just to check the equipment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
we, we do try to make it out to a number of snow tell sites every single year to do a ground truth measurement at least once. Um, we find that it's almost always on the money. So we're, it's very consistent and uh, I've actually personally never taken a measurement at a snow tell site that didn't match up with the site that I didn't already know that there was an issue at. Um, we're constantly looking at the data coming from these sites. Um, so we're, we're usually pretty good at pinpointing when, when there's an issue at that site. It's just like the USGS, if you look at the flow map or charts that they give you, there's a little red X on them every once in a while. That's an actual measurement of the flow in that stream at that site. Oh, yep. So, and, and it's almost always vital. Yep, exactly like that. Unfortunately, we don't report that data uh, with our ground, we don't report our ground truths, but if we did, it would be exactly that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it was uh, 15, 18 inches. Yeah, 18 inches and like three or four inches of sweet. So, um, top secret information. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, do you know the, the retainment pond that they installed at that saddle? It's just behind that. Uh, it's, it's near the top. Um, so, they have that new lodge. You ski down and there's a retainment pond up there, just behind that. And actually, if you're skiing by, you might be able to spot the uh, wind sensor just poking right up over, over that hill. Who tracks wind? Is there any, do you know if wind has increased over time? That's a great question. Um, we don't have a lot of consistency of where we install wind sensors. And, and it's somewhat, it's a somewhat new thing that we're installing those sensors. Um, up until the last couple decades, or I don't know, maybe just over a decade ago, we started installing our first wind sensors. So we don't have a long period of record for that. Um, and then another, another challenge that we run into with some of these measurements, especially wind in the winter time, and all of you who've been up to Schweitzer, you see all that rime ice that builds up on things. Um, and that really affects some of these measurements. And that's, that's the, the ice that creates uh, the snow ghost that you see up there with all those trees. So sometimes our wind sensor will go up there and it will be completely caked with ice. And that's just one of the challenges with having these types of systems in those harsh environments is that it's not always gonna work 100% of the time. Um, one, one little note that I'll put uh, here before moving on is that if you ever come across one of these stations in the winter time especially, uh, just don't, don't walk too close to this, this boom right here. Uh, there's a chance you might walk over the snow pillow and could affect the data. Um, so, yeah, exactly. We'll see a jump of a, a few inches of sweet in, in a couple seconds. Uh, so yeah, and we've had some, you know, there's always people messing with sites and uh, trying to disrupt the data there, but uh, for the most part, people are really respectful. And if you're ever up there, I would definitely uh, recommend checking it out, but maybe from, from a little bit of a distance. All right, so this is a map showing the Snowtel network. Blue dots are Snowtel sites. Um, so basically across the entire Western US and also up into Alaska. There's also these light blue dots in there, and those are snow light sites. Um, they're basically snow tail sites that don't have a precipitation gauge or a snow pillow. And the thinking there is that we, we have strong correlation with snow density between different areas. So if we're able to measure a snow depth at one of those sites, uh, then we're able to use snow density from somewhere else to get an estimate of the, the snow water equivalent. Um, and also the hope is, is that in the future when we produce or there are more technologies that can, they're more condensed than a 12 foot pillow filled with 150 gallons of antifreeze, uh, we could add those to those sites and, and just expand our network pretty rapidly. Um, these are also great candidates for lower elevation areas that might not get as much snow, but where people might wanna have an idea for what the snowpack is like. We only have, I think, uh, maybe five of them in Idaho and they're all uh, pretty far south. So most of our measurement stations up here are either snow tell or the snow courses. So what, what is this data used for? And I'm sure you, you already are thinking of a, a couple different applications. Um, one of the things 
we kind of talked about earlier is just being able to measure the water supply for uh, stream flow forecasting, uh, which can be used for uh, agriculture or hydroelectric power output. Also, people use this data when they're planning their rafting trips. So every single month we send, we work very closely with the National Water and Climate Center, and they publish stream flow forecasts for the upcoming year. With those forecasts, people can take a look and figure out if this is gonna be a good year to go raft the, the Payette or the Salmon River um, and how, how to plan that. Or for anglers looking for best time of year to get the, the peak stream flow or um, look at total stream flow for the year. It's also used pretty heavily by uh, avalanche centers, uh, particularly the snow accumulation data and the wind data. So we work very closely with them. Um, you know, but also people that are just looking to get up in the mountains and you're wondering, is, you know, is there gonna be snow at this elevation? Can I get my truck up there? Or what's the skiing gonna be like today? There's a lot, a wide range of uses for this data. Um, and I'll, I'll show you all how to access that here in a little bit. So um, water is closely tied to uh, our markets. So whether or not we're able to produce, especially here in Idaho, uh, we have, we're a huge agriculture state that relies heavily on snow melt. So certain years, if it's a, a snow drought, then we might not be able to produce as much agriculture and that, that could affect our, uh, some people's incomes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, so zooming, now we kind of went from the bigger picture, let's zoom in to, to your, your basin here in the Priest River. So within your basin, there are two snow tail sites and there are two snow courses. Uh, within a three mile buffer of your basin, there's one snow tail site and four, four additional snow courses. The, the two snow tail sites you can actually see right here, so Bunchgrass Meadow, that's the lower snow tail site, and then uh, Schweitzer Basin, uh, which is another snow tail site. So all of this data goes into our stream flow forecast and also into a lot of the products that I'll be showing you later and, and also our water supply outlook reports where we talk about what your water supply will be like for the upcoming year. Yeah, oh, no question. I don't know what time that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Question is, is, does bunch grass actually flow into Priest Lake Drainage or does it go into the Pond Bray? I believe it does. Um, so actually on this, here's, here's a image of the watershed boundary right here. So bunch grass is right on the boundary. So maybe it flows into both. We usually go over the top on snowmobile, but to the snowmobile in that area and I never can figure out if it actually you know, they drafted over it and priest like somehow or if it went out to probably. You know, that's, that's a good question and I'm, I'm actually not exactly sure um, if it was just cl close enough for us to include it into this basin. It's the main uh, watershed peak that they measure, that Idaho Washington measures to determine. Right. Yeah, I know. It's, it's all, the snow is always deeper on the priest like side than when you drop in the bunch grass. Always. Okay. Um, and then Hidden Lakes, another one that is a question. It, it goes out into, what is it, Cow Creek or whatever. It, and so that drains out to Waters Ferry side. No. Yeah, so it's actually on the, the outside of the boundary. Um, but the way that our forecasts have been developed, and, and this is actually changing a little bit in the near future, um, but our forecasts are based, based on a relationship between the peaks we and how much is observed to be running off. So in, in some terms, um, as long as we've consistently been taking measurements at the same point for that period of record, we can more confidently make estimates of how much is gonna flow off, even if it is a little bit off of what that, that basin is. And they've done a lot of analysis to identify particularly which sites are more correlated with that data. Um, so sometimes it's, it's more about consistency than actual like precision location of, of those, those spots. Um, so here's, here's a map of, of your basin and the snow measurement sites here. Um, the circles are snow tail sites. 
You've got Hidden Lake, Bunch Grass Meadow, and Schweitzer Basin. And then the squares are your snow courses here. Uh, next to the names, you'll, you'll see that there's an elevation and then a number, and, and that, that last number is the number of years that we've been taking measurements at those sites. Or probably not, you know, not us sometimes, sometimes it's cooperators with the Forest Service and, and other agencies and stuff like that. But really impressively, the, the snow courses that Brandon talked about earlier uh, in the, the Priest River Experimental Forest, Benton Meadow and Benton Spring have been measured for 87 years. So that is a very long and rich data set uh, that can provide a, a lot of very useful information. The two snow tell sites have been measured for about, 40, for about 40 years that are in your basin. And then Hidden Lake has been around for about 23 years. So for continuous hourly data, that's, that's a pretty strong record there as well. One thing uh, that Brandon also talked about earlier, and you might see this in this map, is that a lot of our snow tell sites are right around the, the edge of, of your basin, or the, the Priest River Basin. And that's some of the higher elevations of your basin. And, and most, of, most of the Priest River Basin is actually at, at lower elevations. So, so there is this gap in our network, um, and it's pretty consistent across the West, and it just has to do with the way the people before me, my predecessors, design, or decided to design the network. Um, and they, they were also, their primary focus was to measure the mountain snowpack. But now that the needs are changing, we want to be, be able to better observe changes at lower elevations and um, across the basin. We've identified uh, some areas that we, we want to expand our network, either installing snow light or more snow tell sites in this basin. And it's around 4,000 feet is, is our goal in the future. So hopefully there'll, there'll be more sites here. Uh, if I ever come back for a future presentation. So this, a lot of people in this room have probably seen a graph like this, and maybe a lot of people haven't. But this is a very common way that we display uh, the current snowpack in relation to the, the whole record. So this, you can imagine, is accumulating. So we're, we've got snow water equivalent on the y-axis and then uh, time on the x-axis here. So accumulating and then the, uh, the melt off on, on this leg of things. The black line is our current year. Red line is historic minimum. Uh, blue or purple, kind of colorblind. Uh, that's uh, historic maximum. And the green right there is the median. So you can see we're currently doing pretty poor with our snowpack right now. Uh, up here has a little bit more information. It's probably hard for you to read, but we're about 56% of, of the median or the, the normal snowpack that we would typically have for this time of year, uh, which puts us in the seventh percentile. So snowpack is, is currently looking pretty poor. But that's not, early snowpack is never a good determination for what the rest of the season is going to be like. I'm sure we all have memories where it started out amazing, had some great early skiing, and then it just kind of fizzled off, and we had pretty poor snow for the, the, the peak snowpack. And the peak snowpack is this X right here, or the median peak. So in other words, most of the time, we're trying to reach that goal for water supply. We're trying to reach that median peak snowpack. Sometimes if it reaches it earlier and we have early melt off, that could have a lot of implications for, for stream flow in the, the summertime. You might have uh, earlier peak stream flow uh, and then also warmer stream temperatures. Now on the other hand, if you reach the same peak but it doesn't melt off until way later, that could be really beneficial for stream flow throughout the year. So just a quick glance at these graphs can really provide a great understanding for what we're currently at and also what the rest of the season might look like. And this is one of the, the resources or one of the tools that I'll, I'll show you all how to access here in just a little bit. So I, I can never talk about you know, current snowpack without people asking what it's gonna be like for the rest of the year, especially this time of year. Um, so this is the monthly temperature outlook for December. Uh, on the right hand, you can see this area where it's uh, orange and red, so that's uh, likely above normal temperatures. The, the white area is equal chances of above or below, no, of above or below normal temperatures. 
So basically what that's saying is that it's, it's likely to be normal temperatures for December. And here's the same thing, but for precipitation. So December, it's looking likely to be normal. Looking a little bit further out, December through February, you could see a lot more orange in there. So uh, NOAA's predicting that there's gonna be uh, likely above normal temperatures for that, that period, which is a good chunk of our snow accumulation season. And then also below normal precipitation. So I would take that with a grain of salt. You know that the further out you look with forecasts, the less likely they are to be true. Um, but this is just a, a little bit of information to stick in your back pocket if you want to have a conversation about it. And finally, um, one of the most important things that, that we provide through the National Water and Climate Center is our stream flow forecasts. Um, I'll talk a, just a quick, quick little bit about the stream flow. So April through July uh, contributes 66% of the total annual flow vo volume. And you can see that here in this bar chart uh, showing uh, stream volume over time. March through July contributes 75% of the total annual volume. At the bottom here, you can see an example of our, our forecast, which it can look a little bit messy at first, um, but let, let's walk through it. So you'll see, uh, I'll, I'll point this out on, on our website, um, but you'll see a list of forecast points for any given basin. In the Ponderay Basin, the one for this, uh, for your area in the, the Priest River is the Priest River near Priest River, um, and that's right near the confluence, pretty close to where we are right now, actually. It's broken down by forecast period, so April through July and April through September, which with that we're just trying to explain uh, the, the peak stream flow season, so when you're receiving most of that water. And then next to that you'll see a gradient of colors along with percentages. The middle is the median forecast, and on the, the, the other end is the, uh, the 90th percentile forecast which will be in years where, where it might be a little bit wetter. And then on the left, we have the, uh, I believe that's the 10th percentile forecast where it's gonna be years where it's a little bit drier. The reason that we published a whole range of forecasts, I mean, you might notice a range of 55 to 110%. That's, could, that could be a lot of different things for the amount of water that runs off every year. Um, but when we publish these forecasts in sometimes January or February or April, there's a lot of things that can happen between that point and when that water actually starts to flow off. So in a given year, if this April through July forecast was published in April and you had a, a very wet April or April, May, um, then you might be hedging more towards uh, that, the higher end of the forecast. On the other end, if you have a really dry or really, really warm April and May, then you're gonna be hedging towards the, the lower end of that forecast. And one of the places where we explain and, and try to uh, break down some of these, these things that might go into these forecasts is in our water supply outlook report that, that Brandon pointed out earlier. Um, so all of these things, you could Google any of these, uh, these terms right here and you'll find these resources. So the interactive map is one of the, the probably the first thing that I'll show you. Like, all right, so here's an example of the interactive map. This is such a powerful tool. There are so many things you can do with this, and it might be overwhelming at first, but I encourage everybody just to go tinker around with it um, because it, it is pretty simple once you actually start playing with it a bit. So this is showing snow water equivalent as a percent of median across the west, and all of these points are snow tail sites. So we can zoom into our region here, and you can see as you hover over these dots, that's showing the current uh, snow water equivalent as a percent of median. You can click on those, those sites and pull up that chart that I was showing you earlier. And so really quickly, does anybody have any year in mind that was just an outstanding snow year where we got a ton of snow? 96. 96? Okay, 90, do 97. You can scroll down on this right-hand side and choose different years. So 96 was a little bit less, 97 was big. Any really terrible snow years that you have in mind? No, 2004. 2004? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. So it was the water year 20, 2005. That was a terrible year. <laughs> Sounds like good time. <laughs> So, so this, this is such a powerful tool um, if you're curious about comparing different years. Uh, and also just monitoring where we're at right now, which is that, that black dot. Uh-huh. Um, I know you can click on the year and it shows you where the land in the year that you're looking at right now, where is that kind of later and you click through? I think you have to click through it, uh, partially because this, this top line, and same thing with the, the minimum year, that's not just one particular year, that's an aggregate of all, all years that reach those levels. So for example, you know, this might have been, uh, I don't know, like 84 or something like that, and in this point on that max could have been like 92. Yeah, so, so there's not just one particular peak year. Um, Exactly, on that, at, date. on that date, yep. It's like the maximum temperature. Exactly. All right, so just firing through a couple of these other things before we have to move on. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that you can move it from station conditions to basin conditions, and that's gonna pull up the, the basins across the entire west. And that's so, what you Uh, yep, and then so further down, you can scroll through here. Sorry, kind of kind of Russian. You can select just Idaho. You can choose Idaho major basins or the Idaho sub basins. And if you zoom in here, that's that's the Priest River. So you could see uh, averaged amounts for, or a basin index for your whole basin. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. So one other thing we can do, we can look at um, station and basin. So this is, uh, yeah, it's just right at that cutoff. So 49%, 50%, and uh, Hidden Lake is a little bit higher at 69. So that's how they got the 56 with the Hidden Lake. Exactly. So that's the interactive map, and I encourage everybody to just kind of check it out a little bit. One other thing, if I could figure out where my mouse is. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I hope I can get back. Um, I'm gonna just take you all to the Idaho Snow Survey webpage and show you where you can sign up for that water supply outlook report. We send those out every single month from January through June. Oh, where am I? Let's see, I think I would, oh, there we go. Um, so you can just Google Idaho Snow Survey, and it should, one of the first links should be our homepage. You can scroll down a little bit here. We've got uh, just some information on the program. And then this is where you subscribe for the newsletter, which is basically mostly consists of our water supply outlook reports. And it has all of that information broken down for each basin. Um, and it's just a very digestible way for everybody from reservoir operators to uh, to farmers to be able to digest. So it's a great, great resource. Uh, with that, oh yeah. Question for both of you guys. Uh, so when you're taking your snow core sample or your precipitation sample, are they tested for chemical analysis? Is that has to no. So there's no historical data on pH changes. There is. Not on the snow core stuff, but there is for the past 20 years that prep. And you have to search, Google search the National Trends Network and go to their inventive map. Entirely different resource people looking after it, but you can look at precip chemistry there. So it's just the precipitation, it's not the snowpack. It's what fell out of the sky. Yeah. Which, you assume it's going to be in the snowpack. So what, what, what does, uh, you said like, Slightly acid, maybe 5.5. Uh, when is it considered too acidic? And that's when they, I mean, they used to talk about acid rain or right. just rapid lakes. And 
I'm not sure. But it's pretty close to that number. Once it gets above five or below five, then you start having real problems. So they're they're marginal. When I clicked around on it, it was briefly participating, preparing for this, Minnesota. Wyoming, it all appeared to be in that 5.5 range. So I was like, oh, must be a typical pH value for preset. But well, it's the, the carbon dioxide that evolves out of the air is what causes that, that most of that pH. Mm -hmm. It's it's soda water. Falling out of the sky. Now, if you put sulfur, sulfur dioxide in here, then you get sulfuric acid along with your sodium, your, your soda water. So, yeah, we don't do any chemical analysis on our samples, um, but, but yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I, think, I think that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for, for your time and your attention. <laughs> <laughs>